St. John of Avila and St. Damien pray for us. Hey, we've got an old friend on the show, Patrick O'Hearn. Patrick, welcome to the Terry and Jesse show, my friend. Hey, thank you, Jesse, for having me. Hey, this uh, this book that you've written, Courtship of the Saints, How the Saints Met Their Spouses, this is relevant for every single baptized Catholic on planet Earth. Uh, I think I think uh, you're scratching somewhere where the people are itching. That that's a that was a that was a, a great contribution that you gave the Catholic Church by writing that book, my friend. By the way, it's a it's a it's a ten book release. If they want to get the book, where do they go to, Patrick? Yeah, so ten books and Amazon. It's available. Got it. Pre- I prefer for you to go to 10 books. My audience go to 10 books. If you can, uh, yeah, Amazon carries it as well, but uh, let's, let's go right to the Catholic publisher and, and give them some, uh, give them our business. The book is called courtship of the saints, how the saints met their spouses, 10 books.com, 10 books.com. Patrick, let me ask you a question. Uh, the secular world generally uses the word dating, uh, in, in, in traditional Catholic, uh, uh, parlance, we use the word courting. What, what, Number one, why is courtship so important? But also, I would like to hear, what would you say is the difference between dating and courting? Mm-hmm. Yes, the reason courtship is so important today is, as we've seen, you know, marriages are in, in, in disarray, you know, 50% end in divorce. And as I say, how your marriage ends up is it, it's the result of how you prepare for your marriage. And so mm. courtship goes back to, to tradition, biblical times. You know, even Our Lady and St. Joseph, they court, there's courtship, and I have them in my book. So this is something that's steeped in the history of the church and uh, in, in the Bible. And then dating, So and then the word actually courtship came around, it was in the 15th century, and it derived from the term a courtier, which was an advisor to a king or a queen. And then it had... Then it, it progressed on later in that century was the idea of wooing a woman and with the end goal of marriage. Now, on the other hand, dating came into more place in the 20th century. It was, it was basically a, it was a, a it was a term that was used as a kind of a slang for lower class people that went out and it dealt more with popularity. It was it was an idea of popularity of the contest, and so. And, and the the main, and I see really the main difference between the two is, you know, courtship looks to heaven. It looks to eternity, to mm. marriage, and it, it involves the father and the mother. There's a whole parenting aspect. And then you see dating is just, it's focused on the present, you know, pleasure. And, uh, and I do have, as maybe we'll talk in a little bit, but there's four stages of courtship and Father Rippinger was so kind enough to allow me to use some of this information, which I use for my book. But well, hey, just jump stages. into it. You, you just yeah. teased us. Yeah. Get, yeah. Go right now. Tell us the four <laughs> stages of courtship. Yeah. yeah. Come on. Four stages of courtship are the first stage is friendship. And then that lasts three to six months. And again, there's no physical affection during that time. You know, it's a period of getting to know someone. And you, your main purpose is to determine if that other person has virtue. And then if you determine that virtue, and, you know, obviously attraction, there's other levels. Then you ask the father's permission. You move to the next stage, which is courtship. In the second stage, you ask the father's permission, you know, for a man to see if you want to proceed. Again, no physical affection. And this is in a group setting. And again, this is all to protect the virtue of the person in terms of, vir- of virtue, sorry, uh, purity and chastity. And that's to grow in self-denial. And then the third stage is you would, you would go to the betrothal and engagement stage. And that's again, three to six months. This is a, the man would again, ask the father's permission here to marry his daughter. And this we see um, again, there's very, this is when you can start showing some small signs of affection, you know, holding hands, quick pecks on the cheek and even lips. But it's again, the, the goal here is to grow in moderation. And then the final stage of courtship is marriage. And that's your goal is to become a saint together. So these are the four stages. Uh, Father Ribbinger, um, again, set these out. He used it based on St. Thomas Aquinas, and it's, it's it's very clear, Jesse. It's, you know, dating has kind of left many things ambiguous. And here, thanks to Father Ribbinger and the saints, we can see, you know, um, what, a, what a true marriage should look like, which begins with courtship. So let me ask you a question, Patrick. Why were these married saints the greatest lovers? I mean, uh, uh, you'd probably have uh, some people that would say, no. Uh, Elizabeth Taylor with her eight marriages, she's the greatest lover. No, uh, uh, you know, the guy from CNN that was the anchor six on marriage number six, he, he's a great lover. 
why are the saints greater lovers than some of these uh, Hollywood pop icon figures? I say the saints are the greatest lovers because they love God more than their spouse. They love God above everything and their love for their spouse. It flowed from the Eucharist. And, and that is the reason why, you know, St. Elizabeth of Hungary, when her husband, King Louis, would come home, when he'd be out of the country, she would rush to him and it said she would give him a thousand kisses, very affectionate, and is all from, as I said, you know, from the Eucharist. And the more we love God, the more we can love our spouse. And, they, and, and I often said to these saints, you know, in their bedrooms, right, they had the crucifix above their marriage bed. And they saw before themselves, they were comparing themselves to Christ and his love for the church. It wasn't comparing themselves to some Hollywood celebrity. And that's why they were able to love so much, because they were loving with the grace that God gave them. That makes complete sense, because, again, uh, if God is love, as the Bible says, and uh, and the Eucharist is God, uh, as, as we continue growing or filling ourselves with sanctifying grace and inflaming our soul with love— uh, it's, it's, it's going, there's going to be an overflow. It's going to spill over into our spouses and our children and our family. So that makes complete sense. And then I think, I, Patrick, I think that's why, uh, I read from, uh, it was, uh, Dr. Janet Smith years ago. She, she wrote a study on divorce in one of her books. And she said that practicing Catholics, not Catholics, I didn't say Catholics, I didn't say fake Catholics, practicing Catholics have the lowest divorce rate. And I think you just hit the nail on the head. It is because God is love. The Eucharist is God. And the more we receive the Eucharist in a state of grace, we receive more sanctifying grace. So our capacity to love increases for our spouse. So uh, that just com- makes complete sense. Patrick, so what advice would you give to someone to meet their spouse based on these saints' stories? I say, you know, how we have a, the near occasion of sin, right? And that keeps many people from not meeting their spouse. On the flip side, you know, I talk about this near occasion of grace. And the most important thing I say is to be in a life of prayer. And we see this with St. Gianna Mola. She's one of, I interviewed her daughter. And she was praying a novena to Our Lady, asking for direction. It was on that ninth day of her novena. And prior to that, she went on a pilgrimage to Our Lady of to the Lord's Shrine. She wanted direction. And after that novena and going to that pilgrimage, it became very clear on what path God wanted her. And that was to go in the path of marriage. And she met her husband at a priest's first mass. So you talk about, you know, you're not going out to these bars, I mean, and going to places of sin, but you're going to the God's holy places. And that's a great place to meet your spouse, church and the line for confession. And then the other thing I think is patience and trust. Many of these saints, they could have gotten married earlier. St. Veli Martin, she had several suitors, several wealthy men that she could have married, but she waited for the right person, St. Louis. And it wasn't the perfect person. You know, she didn't wait for St. Joseph, although people say that he was like St. Joseph. Hmm. And I think that that's an important lesson for our young people to have patience and trust. You know, maybe you want to get married when you're 20, but God's going to say, you know what, you're going to have, you might have to wait a little bit. Maybe your spouse right now is in a convent discerning their vocation. And so just always having that, uh, that trust of God that it's going to work out if you, if you, you know, if we resign ourselves to his will. And then finally, I think modesty is huge. And uh, there's a saint, um, blessed uh, Anna Maria Taggi. She was a holy mystic and uh, her husband was drawn to her modesty, the way she dressed. And I think the way, you know, a godly woman, if you want to find a godly man, you got to start dressing like that. And so those are just a few points that I think for our young people to, to, uh, they, they can implement from these saints. You know, I saw I saw this uh, good Catholic woman at at Holy Mass uh, at the pair. She had a T-shirt a couple years ago, and it said, uh, and she she was a very modest, uh, holy woman. Her T-shirt said, "Modest is hottest." I thought that was kind of (laughs) cute. Modest is hottest. (laughs) I love. Someone mentioned the other day. I forget that you know Cinderella, right? She got the prince and all she, she only had, she was missing one shoe, right? It was a meme or something. So, you know, that was the only <laughs> part that was missing. <laughs> so Patrick, how can married couples grow in love based on these saints stories? Yeah. Yeah. As, I, as I alluded to St. Elizabeth of Hungary earlier, her affection for her husband. And I think today often maybe it's because of prudishness, but I think a husband and wife, you know, when, when that husband comes home from work, first thing you do, you, you run in and, 
you give your wife a kiss on the lips, you know, and you're not afraid to show affection. Your kids see that, that love that you're, you know, you're, you know, you're cuddling with your wife, you're giving her hugs. And even as your daughters get older, right, they see that they get a hug from their father. You know, it's so important. And so affection is huge. The other thing is constant communication, even throughout the day. You know, we see um, uh, Pietro and, and uh, uh, sorry, and Gianna, they would write love letters to each other, especially when Pietro was on a business trip. So sending a wife to your text or uh, sorry, send, her, send your wife a text saying, I love you. How are you doing today? You know, just keeping that and also words of affection. Um, I love you. You know, just as we pray the Hail Mary, say that to our bride. You know, I love you throughout the day, just like the Hail Mary. And then I think forgiveness is huge. You know, and, and some of these saints, I included many stories of betrayal. You know, one one uh, lady, she's a blessed Elizabeth Cora, Mora, sorry. Her husband left her, abandoned the family. And then after she died, uh, after he died, he became a priest. But she prayed constantly for his conversion. So I think forgiveness is, is a huge element. What was her name again? Yeah, her, her name is Blessed Elizabeth Mora. So she had two daughters, and then uh, after she passed away, her husband you know, took all her funds, cheated on her, and uh, but she kept praying for him. And then, and then right after she died, he became a priest. There's been several stories that I've read of, of, of female saints that, that have had b- bad marriages, and they just, uh, they just kind of uh, you know, kept on uh, you know, trucking through that bad marriage, doing penance and prayer, and their husbands, some some of them upon their, their death, some of them post death, had a massive conversion to Christ, and some of them some of them became priests. So, uh, she's not the only one, and and that's uh, that's again the power of redemptive suffering for your husband. That that can be the reason why God put you on planet Earth to save that man that you married in the Catholic Church in the sacrament of marriage. Patrick, how can people get your book? We're going to have you on for another segment, but how can people get your book? Yeah, so go to uh, www.tanbooks.com. So what inspired you to write this book? Yeah, is it because, again, we, you're seeing the crisis in marriage uh, in the West, and you said, man, somebody's got to address this issue and give some, yeah. some uh, concrete examples of some, uh, yeah. uh, of, of some role models. Is, is that, is that yeah. what your thinking was? Yeah, that was one of them. There's several reasons. I also see the crisis in the church, right? You know, with our with our bishops and priests, and and yeah. the way that mm-hmm. I see the holiness is coming through the family, and and so I see right now it's like we we elevate you know priestly stories. How did you had your calling? We hear that all the time, and it's it's beautiful. But we need to talk about how how do you have a how do these saints have their calling to marriage? So that was a reason. I've always been fascinated with marriage stories. I feel like you know our church is going to be. You know, we need more saints, and it's going to come through marriage. Let's talk about uh, the role of the saints and angels in finding a spouse. Particularly, I want you to talk about St. Raphael, his role, St. Father Pio's role, because I believe you have two stories in your book uh, where you talk about what they can do to help couples today. I do. St. Raphael is actually the, the patron of finding a spouse and, and you know that beautiful story in the old testament from tobit he leads unknowingly leads tobias to his future wife sarah you know here sarah's seven previous husbands have been slayed by the the demon asmodeus and so of course any man would be trembling and i, I love the words that saint raphael said he goes he said do not be afraid you know she was destined to you from eternity and so here is this this archangel standing next to you know Tobias, just encouraging him, prompting him. And I think he wants to do the same for our single people. And there's a reason that he is the patron of finding a spouse. And I, in the back of this book, I include a beautiful prayer to him. And I think all our young people uh, should should seek St. Raphael's prayers, um, finding a spouse, and, uh, and especially your guardian angel, too. I mean, he cannot put that past you. I mean, it's so, so important. And then I think Padre Pio uh, introduced, there's a couple Dr. Germain and uh, Orchard Bianchi, I was able to include their marriage story in there. And they, they went over to, they met in San Giovanni Rotondo and Padre Pio basically was like their matchmaker. And he inter- introduced them. And it was interesting after they met um, Germain, uh, he had, he was an American and uh, his wife was from the Czech Republic, but, in, and he was, he went to Padre Pio for advice and confession. And he's like, should I marry her? And he goes, marry her and prepare well for your marriage. And he was, he was going to actually officiate at their wedding, but he, he died the next month. He was too ill, but he 
bless their marriage. And with their daughter, one of their daughters is uh, Sister Faustina uh, Pia. She's a sister of life, and she wrote this beautiful prayer, the Litany of Trust. So it's you see how like how these saints, just how important they are. And I think too, like Saint Padre Pio, we think, oh man, I wish he was alive. You know, when I when, so I can meet my spouse, I wish I had that grace. But he's even more powerful in heaven now, interceding for you. So I think we need to call upon Saint Raphael and Saint Padre Pio. Uh, not only to find our spouses for those who are, you know, discerning that, but even just to restore our marriages. Yep, those are my go-to saints every single day. Say Rafael and say Padre Pio. They're they're part of my morning prayers uh, in terms of of the uh, the the communion of saints that I call upon. Those are my go-to every single day. So we're you and me are thinking in the right in the same direction there, Pat. Hey, let's talk about singles in the Catholic Church. They're they're often forgotten. So what message of hope do you have for them? And what is the responsibility of married couples and priests to single Catholics? Yeah, I have a section on here called Be Apostles to Singles. And I think often it's, we forget about them, you know, especially, you know, you have on St. Valentine's Day and you just, they're kind of left alone. And I feel like as, as Catholics, we do have, you know, married couples should consider, you know, after you want to ask their opinion, but like, hey, I know another friend, can I, can I set you up? You know, would you like to meet this person or even a priest? You know, often in this story, you know, I had St. Jose Maria Scriva and he acted as a spiritual father for one, um, one, one young man, uh, Tomas Alvera and Tomas was going to join Opus Dei and, and, and uh, St. Jose is like, no, you're not called to this. And I think as priests, sometimes they, I'm going on a little tangent, but they can be vocations directors can try to recruit people but instead, these spiritual directors need to see what's best for this soul. And sometimes maybe they're advising two, two single people at the same time and says, you know, hey, I, you should meet this person. And I think that that's the role that as we need to build up strong marriages. And, and I think one of the ways we do that is not only praying for them, but, you know, asking, can we introduce you to someone? If, you know, another Catholic that we know, not being afraid to do that. That's a very good point, Patrick, because you're right, especially during Valentine's Day, I think a lot of our young people that are single, they do feel like, okay, what's in it for me here? You know, they're just kind of twiddling their thumbs. And, and that, that's a great point you make. We, we can't forget them. They're, I mean, they're part of the mystical body of Christ too. And they're probably, you know, most, most Catholics are, are destined to the sacrament of marriage just by percentage. I mean, 99.9% .9 of Catholics will be called to the sacrament of matrimony and probably about, you know, a, a fraction of 1% will be called to holy orders. So you're right. We have to, we have to pay more attention to our single people. So let me ask you, um, let's, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, the devil's out to destroy marriage. There's one demon in particular right in the Old Testament, the book of Tobit. You just mentioned him. That's no secret. So in these stories, you, just, you don't just present the glamorous stories. You present some stories where some of the future saints were betrayed by their spouse. Some of them made major mistakes and how did God bring good out of these trials and how can he bring good out of our marriages today? Yeah. And, and one of the stories I have is, you know, St. Rita, right? Saint, the saint of the impossible. And her story, you know, she met, married a guy. She was, she wanted to become a nun since she was little and her parents said, you know, since you're our only child, we want you to take care of us when you get older. And she's like, that, I can, I can live with that. But then she's like, then we want you to marry this person. And so basically she was, had an arranged marriage to a man who was not very virtuous at all. And that guy, he was very, turned out very abusive to her, verbally abusive and perhaps even physically abusive. And, and during that verbal abuse, she just, she kept praying for him. She kept silent and asking God to change his heart. And it was only after her, her humility and prayers won him over. And then he eventually had a conversion. And when he had that conversion, then God blessed them with two children. And I thought that was very interesting as well, because it's like God wasn't going to bless them with children because his heart was, he was living, in a, he was a sinful man, but just, just completely abusing his wife. And so once he converted, they had two children, and then he was eventually murdered by people from his former life after his conversion. So he had many enemies, but then obviously he reconciled with God. But these enemies got back at him and killed him. And then, as you know, Rita's two boys tried to seek revenge on the murderers of their father. And Rita said, Lord, take my boy's life before they commit, you know, the sin of revenge. And so she lost her two boys and her husband. And then she eventually 
sought to become a nun. And uh, she was led in the middle of the night by three, three, three saints. I think one of them was St. Augustine. And that's, she kept applying for the convent and they kept saying, no, no, no. And eventually that's why she's the patron saint of the possible causes because she became a nun, even though, cause she was led, you know, mystically or whatever, mysteriously to the, through the convent walls in the middle of the night. And, uh, but she gives, she gives mothers great hope and life to, you know, continue to pray for your spouses, especially those that are very rough and, uh, maybe possibly verbally abusive and, uh, and, and also fallen away from the faith. What? Yeah. And, uh, she, she, she's one of the iconic stories for people that uh, are in despair when you read her life story and, and, and you'll develop a devotion to her. You'll start calling her in your, in your daily prayers. You, you'll start calling her for an intercession. Uh, very, very inspirational story. Talk about persevering. I'm, I'm sure some divorce lawyer would have told her, you know, back in her time, Hey, just leave the bum, just come over here and stuff and fill out this uh, application. We'll go to divorce court and we'll, we'll call it a day. No, but th- some of these women, Patrick, back in the Middle Ages and in times past, they were they 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 knew the 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 holiness, the sacredness of the sacrament of marriage. They knew what they did, and boy oh boy, they had they ha- they held onto their marriage with tenacity, didn't they? They did. And one of the stories I just have a brief part portion of it, but there's a guy named Blessed Jacopone, and his wife was Bona di Vendetti. And blessed Jacopone, he was a very wealthy lawyer, secular. And uh, right after they got married, he invited his his wife. She was very holy, Vanna. And she there's a tragic accident. She fell off some stands at a public event. She died. And wow. and and when and when when she discovered that she died, she was wearing a hair shirt on. And his she was basically offering up that hair shirt, her her, her suffering, mortification for her husband's conversion. He became a bro, a religious brother after that. And he is attributed as writing the Stabat Mater. And I think it's just, it just shows you again, here's a wife, just mortification, offering, you know, her daily sacrifices, her suffering. Because, you know, we think about Jesse, the cross sometimes, God says, take up your cross, right? That cross could actually be your spouse, right? I mean, that's you're carrying your spouse. I heard a priest say that one time in a homily, and he, he, was given a, uh, he was given a talk about that. And this guy came home, and he picked up his wife. And he started carrying around the house, and the wife's like, "What are you doing?" And he's like, "Yeah, the priest told me to pick up my cross." Now, I, I don't recommend that, but I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't recommend that, especially if you got back problems. Uh, Patrick, uh, uh, so what's the role of father in courtship? Yeah. I say the father, as according, you know, thanks to Father Ripiger. I mean, I used his words, but he's like the watchman and the guardian of of the of the wife of his daughter. And he can, he can basically, his mission is to see if this man is honorable for his daughter, you know, and that's a huge role. And I think about, we have these the security cameras, right, to protect our, our house. You know, we want to protect our children's physical body and rightly so. But do we have the same protection on their soul, which is a million times far greater than, you know, any physical, physical property that we have. And I think the man, the father has to be in touch. And obviously he can, he can end the courtship at any stage. Like if he sees this man isn't honorable enough. Now the, the, the daughter could go ahead and right. She could go behind her father's back and get married still. Right. I mean, but I think a most virtuous father, and he, he recognizes that like that this man is not virtuous for his daughter. I think a daughter should in obedience you know, respect her father's wishes. So again, he's this watchman and guardian of her, of the, of his daughter's soul. Amen. Hey, last question. So what do Catholic men and women in general, uh, they have no idea how to pursue women chastely and purely. What can you say about that? I think it, it comes down. I'd say mostly from our, our fathers, you know, we're mm. a lot of the times, you know, we're, we're steeped in, you know, pornography, all these sins. And we're just, we, we just think like, you know, we're going to let the church support, you know, teach our children, yeah. but this is our responsibility. Amen. Patrick, I hear the music, my friend. Good job, brother. You've done a, a, a mighty work for Holy Mother Church. Get Patrick's book, Courtship of the Saints, How the Saints Met Their Spouses, tanbooks.com. Courtship of the Saints, How the Saints Met Their Spouses. Go to tanbooks.com. Thank you, Patrick. We'll have you on again, my brother. God bless you. Keep the faith. Thank you for what you did. 